All right, big welcome, everyone. Good morning, and welcome to the podcast lounge at uh, South by Southwest. We're excited you're here. We're excited you're making time for us on a Sunday morning. We promise it's going to be worthwhile. I'm going to try to stay out of the way as much as I can other than to direct the conversation because you have three of the smartest people in the oncology world sitting on this couch and chair next to me. I'm Aaron Strout. I am the Chief Marketing Officer of Real Chemistry. We're the ones that are hosting this today. Uh, I'm also probably more germane to this conversation, the host of the Real Chemistry podcast. And we love doing these things because it's a great way to bring smart people to the masses. So um, I think if you are following along and if you're not here for this reason, then you can go to another session. But we're talking about partnering to unlock hope for the future of cancer care. And note, there are a lot of sessions on oncology, cancer care. This is specifically talking about partnerships and why it's so important. And again, we have three uh, preeminent organizations here that really are amazing at doing this. And a lot of what you will hear today is how we can fo focus on people that don't necessarily have access. There are a lot of people, if you have money, you probably get the best care, you've got great insurance. If you don't, then you get forgotten, and unfortunately, the divide is getting wider and wider. Uh, we have technology. Technology, in some ways, is making things worse, uh, which I know sounds crazy, especially at an event like this, but we'll talk a little bit about that as we go forward. Um, might talk a little bit about State of the Union and or the Saturday Night Live parody of State of the Union. And without further ado, I would like to um, introduce my guests. I'm not going to do anything too, too wild and crazy, but I want to give sort of a top line to each of them. And then I'm going to make it interesting by giving a fun fact. We found out that Harlan is a unicycle rider. I'm joking. Um, I, I use that as an example. He's like, what is that, weird? I'm like, it's a little weird. So, um, so starting to my right, we have Dr. Harlan Levine. He's the president of Health Innovation Policy at City of Hope. He's going to talk a little bit about what City of Hope is in a minute. Um, he is the former exec at, at uh, places like Anthem and Optum, which I think is helpful to this conversation. We're not going to beat up the payers, but the payers sometimes can be part of the problem in this overall equation. So, um, and Harlan is also, um, you're the chairman of Access Hope, is that the correct title? Yes. Correct. To his right, we have Dr. Karen Knudsen, Knudsen. Sorry, I'm trying to work on making sure I get that one right, and we're going to call her Karen after this. Um, Dr. Knudsen is the chief executive officer of the American, I'm sorry, not the American Cancer Society. Uh, I was right. The American Cancer Society, and... More importantly, because this unlocks her ability to say things that she really wants to say. Also, the CEO of the American Cancer Society uh, Cancer Action Network, or CAN. And she has uh, previous executive roles at places like Jeff Jefferson Health. And so we're so excited to have you both here. And then last but not least, we have Dr. Cliff Huddis. He is the CEO of the American Cancer Society of Clinical Oncology, otherwise known as ASCO. And he is the vice chair of Conquer Cancer and the chair of the uh, ASCO Cancer, Cancer Link. All that used to be true, yes. It's in the bio, so if it's in the bio, it's like what's on the internet, it must be true. As of December. <laughs> well, so we're gonna have an engaging conversation, but I wanna do two things. One, I wanna start with a fun fact from each of you so people can get to know you. We'll close with the fun fact before we get to questions. I'm gonna to try to leave about 10 to 15 minutes at the end. It's gonna be hard because we have a lot of ground to cover and a lot of good things to say. The other thing that um, I wanna do is I wanna give each of our speakers an option to sort of talk about their POV, a little bit about their organization, then their POV on this idea of partnering so that we can have better cancer care. So why don't we start with you, Harlan. Um, aside from unicycling, what is the fun fact about you? Well, the setup for the fun fact is about 30 years ago, 25 years ago, I wrote an episode on for TV for LA Doctors. But the fun fact is, I think there's Nielsen proof that my wife is the only person in the country to have seen all 24 episodes of LA Doctors. But the really fun fact is after watching an episode, this will tell you the era, we watched an episode and then we switched the channel and watched ER. And my wife turns to me and says, now that's really a good show. For <laughs> so that's my fun fact. You're like, honey, that's not really a compliment when you say that, right? 
Thank you, Harlan. Uh, Karen. Yeah, so maybe my fun fact is the easiest way to get to know me. Uh, although, as a CEO of the American Cancer Society, my life is on the road. Last year, I traveled 48 out of 52 weeks because we operate in 5,000 communities across the country. But if you want to know who I am, if you think about that stereotypical Philadelphia sports fan, because I am a diehard Philadelphian, that's me. Eagles, Flyers, Phillies, Sixers. I'm at the I'm at the game and I'm definitely watching and I am that obnoxious. So there you go. Fly Eagles, I love it. Cliff? Fly Eagles fly. Fly Eagles fly. Sorry, I'm a Patriots fan, so I don't know the. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. we'll Sorry. talk about that later. Yes, we will. So I had a fun fact teed up, but because Karen went with Philadelphia, and I'm always accused of saying that all roads and medicine lead through Philadelphia. My fun fact that I sold Liberty Bells during the United States Bicentennial at the Betsy Ross House. I was going to replace that with one relevant to Harlan, which was my apartment uh, was an episode of Law and Order uh, in uh, about 2000 and uh, um, no, backing up about 1994. The more you know. So thank you for sharing those fun facts. And then why don't we go back in reverse order. So Cliff, let's talk a little bit about ASCO high level what it is and then what your view on partnerships because we know how critically important they are to your organization. Yeah, this is a great topic for us. And let me just back up by saying the American Society of Clinical Oncology is an unusual professional society because it's multidisciplinary. Medicine, meaning medical oncology, surgical oncology, radiation oncology, pathologists, psychiatrists, and so on. And I make that distinction because 94 5% of professional societies are single discipline. So collaboration across the specialties is built into our DNA. Secondly, all of cancer care virtually is multidisciplinary, and that's A, a reason for our structure, and B, an argument for collaboration. So I would just end it there by saying that uh, we collaborate because it's the best, and I would say only way, to make meaningful and rapid progress against cancer. Great. Thank you, Cliff. Karen? Yeah, I couldn't agree more with Cliff. I've been a long-standing ASCO member my entire career. So, you know, I, I very much agree with, the, with everything you just said, Cliff. For the American Cancer Society, we're not a professional organization. We represent the 2 million people in America this year that will hear that they have cancer and the 600,000 unfortunate individuals who will die of their disease. So what we do every day is to improve the lives of cancer patients and their families through research, advocacy, and patient support. We're the largest funder of cancer research outside the U.S. government, funding 50 people who went on the, to win the Nobel Prize. We work in those 5,000 communities through patient support to provide the things that I think we'll talk about where people fall through the cracks, transportation, lodging, um, patient navigation, patient education, for which we have a great partnership with ASCO. So really important. And then durable solutions coming through that last hat that Aaron talked about through policy change with operations at the federal government and all 50 states plus Puerto Rico and Guam, I would not forget them, uh, where we affect change at the state or the territory level on behalf of cancer patients and families. Having said all that, could not do it without partnerships. We have 1.5 million people who volunteer every year for ACS. Last night, and I'll just give it this example, I had, uh, we, we have something called Road to Recovery, of a place where we have people drive patients back and forth to care. So I had two stories that came last night from my patient support team. One of an individual who drove someone from South Carolina to Atlanta, 350 miles just to get them to cancer care. And another story of someone who, who we found out about within our ranks that we recruited as a volunteer and helped, who drove an individual 60 times, six zero, back and forth to care, and they didn't even speak the same language. And so they had to come to us to get a translator to say, I'm so glad you finished your care. So this is the kind of thing that we do every day. And the partnerships at the corporate level, at the foundation level, at the individual level is how we do it. We are one ecosystem, and we have to be if we're going to end cancer as we know it for everyone. Well, bless you for doing that. It's, I mean, this is so critically important, and I, I can't say that enough, and I think we've all been touched by it, so we appreciate that. Harlan? Yeah, so this is going to be an opportunity for true consensus because we all believe um, in the importance of collaboration, and we all represent different aspects of the same issue we're trying to solve. So I am at City of Hope. City of Hope is a National Cancer Institute designated comprehensive cancer center. Uh, we've been around for over 110 years. 
uh, we're, in some ways, we're, we're the rubber hits the road of what you just heard uh, Cliff and Karen talk about. We treat about 121,000 of those 2 million people that will hear that they have cancer. Uh, we were pr previously in one county, in one state. We've been spreading out. We're now in five major counties across four states. Um, you know, partnership to us is vital. I would say about 15 years ago, we started to make a pivot. Typically, an academic med medical center is a little bit of an ivory tower. You have to travel to the ivory tower. In some cases, you have to get admitted to the ivory tower, you know, passing certain criteria. Uh, but we made that pivot to realize that if we try to live like that in the current ecosystem and where healthcare is going, we're gonna become obsolete. So we've uh, moved to really focusing on the partnerships that you're talking about. We've moved into the communities. We've become very active in policy. We collaborate with these two organizations. Uh, we started working directly, not in opposition to, but in partnership with health plans and employers. And I'd love to get a chance to talk about some of that down the road. So um, I just want to emphasize what you heard from Cliff and Karen. We can all excel in certain areas, but if we're not collaborating, the patients are going to be, the, the patients at their most vulnerable time with a burden that they've never imagined going on an unwanted journey are going to have to navigate between all these stakeholders. We're working together to try to make it a seamless experience for that, that cancer patient and their family. Yeah, and I've had a lot of conversations with Harlan, and I, we're going to get into something a little bit later, Patient Bill of Rights. He has been a true champion. I love sort of what they stand for. They're a client, by the way, just in full disclosure, but I would love them irrespective of their relationship. One other thing I want to point out is you heard we'll, me we'll say- We'll see how things go today about that's that. That's true. Client. That's fair. I appreciate that. Um, two things I always love is perspective, and so the fact that we have three people with MD in their titles, and so these aren't people Disclaimer, that- Disclaimer, PhD. PhD, PhD, MD, MD. Um, it's always helpful to have people that are very smart and have some of that same experience. And I think I love the fact that we have Memorial Sloan Kettering, Jefferson Health, Optum, Anthem. So these are people that have experienced a number of parts of the ecosystem. And I think understanding that goes a long way, especially when you're talking about partner, partnering, how you can actually bring change to bear. So one of the things I want to start with, and uh, Karen, maybe we'll start with you, is we know that we've all been touched by cancer. There are unique challenges around this, and I know we're going to speak to partnering, but I think understanding what are some of the challenges unique to cancer vis-a-vis -vis things like diabetes or heart disease, et cetera. So maybe you can kick us off there. Yeah, so I think until someone uh, has a cancer journey, either themselves or someone that they're caring for, they don't really appreciate how much a cancer patient is a frequent flyer. And it is a deeply Byzantine path that we put patients in front of to try to navigate. You've gotten a cancer diagnosis, now you need to find a surgical oncologist, then there's gonna be a medical oncology plan, then we're gonna do some genetic testing, and that might dictate what happens next. And oh, by the way, you probably need to be considered for a clinical trial. The thing that you need is actually, uh, you know, four states away. And we put all of this in front of individuals who are struggling with just getting beyond hearing that you have cancer. So it's not just putting it on them. It's also their caregiver. And so solving for the things that are beyond the biology, solving for the biology is key, but also solving for the psychology. How is it that we prepare patients and caregivers to, to essentially make it through this Byzantine path. Things like transportation, I'm just gonna pick on that for a second, are incredibly important. So I know from when I was running oncology for Jefferson Health, 16 hospital system across two states, 16% of my patients on any given year missed care because they had no ride. These are this what I call the basic blocking and tackling of cancer. And if I can show up at the infusion center five days a week, but Harlan can only get there three days a week, Who's going to have the better outcome? So there are so many things that are within our power right now to solve for that we can do to increase survival from cancer in addition to pushing the envelope on discovery for innovation and prevention, detection, and cure. So I think that's what makes cancer so different. But the last thing I would say, Aaron, is the high watermark for cancer mortality rate in this country was 1991. Since that time, we have reduced the overall cancer mortality rate for the 200 diseases we call cancer, by 33%. 
that is a win. And that's what you're also not necessarily seeing in other disease types. And how did that happen? It came through cancer research, getting to people. Thank you. And Cliff, I think you wanted to add something quickly to Well, Karen just got to it at the end. In addition to the remarkable social factors, which you touched on, I think something that can't be overemphasized in distinction to some of the other chronic illnesses is that cancer is a growing collection of individual or unique diseases, plural, and the treatment approach is increasingly customized, not just to the type of cancer based on histology, which is tissue of origin and, and the cell type even, but it's the biology based on, for example, genomic testing and so forth. And that's really important educationally for our community to keep up with, but it's also really difficult for patients to navigate because what their neighbor's breast cancer looked like and their experience doesn't necessarily relate to the one that you're having six months later or two years later for a variety of reasons. Um, so I think that that's another uh, challenge for us. I do want to just emphasize the essentially the disparities point that you just made. Um, one of the simple takeaways for everybody is this. Um, if we simply delivered known current standards of care to everybody for whom they're appropriate, there are estimates that there'd be a 15 to 20% further improvement in cancer mortality in the United States. Said more plainly, it, the science is really important, but progress in the delivery of known effective treatment is that probably the single largest step we could ever make in improving outcomes. I, I need to jump in here because I think this topic is the foundation for the rest of the discussion. Uh, City of Hope a couple years ago started a um, coalition called Cancer Care is Different, and it's building on what you just heard, but just uh, from a ecosystem point of view, I'm, by the way, I'm an internist. I'm not a cancer doctor. I took care of diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease. I've been doing administrative work for over 20 years, but I can still go back and help manage a diabetic or a high blood pressure case. In cancer, with, with what Cliff was talking about, it is changing so fast that the entire ecosystem, the network of physicians are challenged to keep up. And in fact, the gap that between standard of care and optimal, or usual care and optimal care is actually widening because of the rapidity. So there's an added burden of making sure that information is getting to that network so everyone can get that standard of care. Most people think California has a high standard of care. Over 50% of patients did not receive care that was concordant with the National Cancer Center Network guidelines. The last comment I'll make is from a patient point of view, things like diabetes, high blood pressure, cholesterol, there's a very large behavioral component to it. You can control your diet, you can control your exercise, the types of food that you eat and how much. Once you get cancer, you have all those psychological and, and supportive care needs, but you're really at the hands of, am I getting the right, did I get the right diagnosis with the right test and did, am I getting the right treatment? It's, it's just a different animal than those other conditions that you mentioned. And I think that's really important as we talk about some of the solutions of how to get everybody access to the right level of care. Well, I love that, and that tees up a question, actually two things. We are going to get into some success stories, because I know everyone loves to hear about doom and gloom and why this is never going to get fixed. Joke. Um, but one of the things that I would like to talk about is we just went through this thing called the pandemic. Does everyone remember that? Like how much fun that was? Yeah, Kareem, you remember that. So one of the things, though, that did happen is we sort of had a new view on vaccines, particularly things like MNR M. NRA. And one of the things that we are finding is that vaccines, lo and behold, may be able to help on the prevention and the treatment of cancer. So I'd love to tee that up. You know, Karen, you're nodding. Do you want to start with us? For sure. So let's go back to that 33% cancer mortality reduction since 1991. When you unpack it, the vast, vast majority of that comes from prevention and early detection. So a massive win that we had in the cancer world is, is vaccination against cancers caused by the human papillomavirus. And the first one that we're seeing success in, because uh, it's a relatively early age diagnosis, is cervical cancer. So when we do 
did our report last year, which is what we do every year, looking at cancer incidence and mortality across the country. Massive win in cervical cancer. A staggering 65% reduction in cancer incidence, cervical cancer incidence, specific to women who are ages 20 to 24, because they are the first cohort to have received vaccination against HPV. Now, HPV causes a host of other cancers, and people will start to age into those cancers. So critical that men and women, or boys and girls, are vaccinated, and we will start to see protection against those other diseases as well. So now we have the first real-world evidence that we have a cancer prevention vaccine that works. And here's another little fun fact, because I'm always on the road. I think I'm going to go on a prediction. I like I th- predictions. I think there's a first part in the United States that's going to see eradication of cervical cancer as we know it is Puerto Rico. 90% uptake of HPV vaccination for adolescents. That is a win. And so if we are going to afford cancer care and we are going to end cancer as we, as we know it, we are going to have to shift into this early diagnosis and prevention stage. And that's going to take all of us leaning in. I would just even build on that by pointing out that Australia, setting the bar high, has declared a goal of eliminating HPV-caused malignancy by vaccinating the country fully. And I would love to see us and other countries duplicate that. I do want to draw an important distinction, though, for everybody who's just learning about this. We have an additional antiviral vaccine that is a cancer prevention. That, of course, is hepatitis B. Outside of the United States, one of the most common solid tumors is hepatoma, not so common in the U.S. That's hepatocellular carcinoma, typically caused by hepatitis B and transmitted mother to child. So it's a huge problem that can be disrupted. However, when one gets excited about vaccinating for cancer, it's important to recognize that these two massive successes are actually traditional infectious disease vaccines that have a byproduct of lowering the incidence of specific cancers. If we go to target specific cancers out of the starting gate, I would just submit to you that the challenge is a bit steeper. Yeah. Agree. Um, I do want to shift because this is the most important part, and then we have a few other things that we could cover. We could talk. I joked up front, I'm like, I could just introduce you all and let you talk for an hour, and this would be fantastic, but I'm going to steal the conversation. I do want to get to the successes before we run out of time. And Harlan, I'm going to give you the mic first. And one of the things I'd love for you to tee up, you can have two if you want, but you have this idea around a patient's bill of rights, and I'd love for you to talk a little bit about that because I think we can enable this whole audience, not just here, but there are going to be thousands of people that listen to this afterward because it's a podcast. So we'll start with you and then we'll round robin about maybe one example that you see as a shining success story building on what you talked about with Puerto Rico and building on Australia. So Harlan? Sure, thanks. There's a buildup to the patient bill of rights. The, 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 The challenge we have is that everyone in this country knows we have an affordability problem in healthcare. And and now maybe if we shifted to prevention, we could reduce some of that cost, but that's another, another topic. But we're doing a lot of things in the, the corporate side, the business side of healthcare, that's having negative impact on cancer patients. So everyone has heard of the term value-based care. It really irks me. Nothing more in my job irks me than when I hear people talk about value-based care and nowhere in that equation is how a patient defines value. Value Value-based care, no matter how you hide it, will start with reducing cost, but it doesn't include usually outcome, patient experience, time to treatment. So all the things that if you're a cancer patient, believe me, you're worried about your outcome, your functionality, return to normalcy, respect in the process, none of that's part of value. So there's an industry shift towards focusing on the cost of care, which is then leading to different strategies. One strategy is something called a limited or narrow network. When you sign up for your insurance, you have a choice of a broad network, a narrow network, sometimes a specific medical group. Well, if you pick up on what Cliff was talking about, cancer 15 years ago was just you know 10 to 15 common cancers and a couple rare ones. But now you have hundreds of different types, each defined by a DNA blueprint because of precision medicine. In that group that you have, that narrow network of doctors, you may or may not 
have someone that is expert in your type of lymphoma or your specific type of triple negative breast cancer. So it just, it, narrow networks work in diabetes where the information is ubiquitous and the talent is out there. In cancer, the more you narrow your network, by definition, you're cutting off and creating a new barrier to expertise. So the idea is, let's create a bill of rights that starts with a simple premise, which is every patient with cancer should have the right to access the right level of expertise. Just conceptually, you shouldn't have to go to a doctor that's not expert in your rare form of brain cancer. And there's lots of data we can get into to show that the outcomes are different. But if you build on that, a cancer patient should have the right to culturally sensitive care, culturally appropriate information, navigation throughout their process. So we created a, not an infinite, but a list of five to seven topics like those that basically say, if you're a cancer patient, it's what you would want for yourself or a loved one, and everyone should have the ability to access that. The last one I want to point out, which both Karen and Cliff talked about, is you have no idea how hard it is to get into a research trial. And it's getting more and more difficult because you get put into these little subgroups that aren't affiliated with academic centers. So part of our Bill of Rights in California, we started with a coalition. We started with a Bill of Rights that included the right to access care. It didn't have any teeth, but then the state legislator said, well, let's put some teeth in it. And we turned that into a state mandate that basically said, if you have Medicaid, in California it's called Medi-Cal, which by the way, one third of the state has, you would build on this Bill of Rights and if you have a complex cancer, you have the absolute right to get to the level of care that you need, the absolute right to get to a research trial, and whoever is taking care of you now has the affirmative obligation to let you know that. So Bill of Rights leading to legislation that really is you know, mandating action and trying to close a gap. Thanks, and I think this might come up again as if there's one takeaway, this might be Harlan's key takeaway. Cliff, I know during our prep you had a great example, and I'd love for you to share it, you know, speaking to that patient navigation piece. I mean, building on this last topic, um, when the Affordable Care Act was passed in 2008, among its many improvements in the landscape for us was the requirement that commercial insurers and um, Medicare provide coverage for the routine costs of care for patients who enrolled in clinical trials. And I can share with you in my prior part of my career when I was at Memorial Sloan Kettering, I would have the truly insane conversation uh, with, forgive me, with representatives of payers where I was trying to enroll patient on a phase two or a phase three clinical trial and they would say, we don't cover research. And I would literally somewhat sarcastically say, okay, instead of you paying the modest outpatient costs associated with this trial, I'll admit that patient for a week of inpatient therapy. And they would say, okay. It was insane, counterproductive, lose-lose for everybody. Of course, I never did such a thing. But at any rate, um, there was a loophole in the ACA, which I don't technically understand at this point. But for a variety of reasons, Medicaid, exactly what Harlan was talking about, was exempted at the state level from this access. Now, let me just give some numbers. About 20% uh, of Medicaid recipients in the United States are black. About um, 12 or 13% of the population is black. And about 6% of clinical trialists, trial participants in the U.S. before this were black. This is a classic example of structural racism uh, or an unintended consequence. So beginning right after the passage of the, of the uh, Affordable Care Act, we began to lobby on Capitol Hill with others for correction to this. The bad news, it took a decade. The good news is we got it done, and we were able to get it done with evidence because it turned out, just like you'd predict, that at the state level for Medicaid, it cost budget dust, pennies, to actually provide this coverage, and it may even be cheaper than paying for conventional therapy in some settings. Uh, but now there's a 50-state mandate for Medicaid to operate under the same rules as everyone else. So this is a pinpoint solution to a very specific problem opening up clinical trials access to everybody. I think it's so helpful to hear that because I think sometimes we hear all these statistics that work against us. And so knowing that there, there's a construct that we can look at, there are some examples we can look at and 
Karen, I know you're going to share another great example. Yeah, and that, that example is patient navigation. So I, when I came to three years ago to head the American Cancer Society from oncology, I had a big, hairy, audacious goal, and that was to get patient navigation to become a reimbursable component of cancer care. So I love a good moonshot, and as many times as we you know, walked into the White House and talked about moonshots, I kept emphasizing what is a ground shot, something we can do right now now to enhance access to care, which is, I think, a lot of what we're talking about. Patient navigation has been studied by us, by ASCO, by others, and shown to lift all boats. A patient who's navigated understands their care. They complete their care as planned. They have better outcomes, full stop. A patient who is navigated also has a lower cost of care because they don't end up in your emergency department, which is a high cost, low efficiency place to get cancer care. So everybody wins. There was no reason not to have patient navigators except that nobody could bill for them. And if you can't bill for them, you can't afford them. Only you know elite centers could, could park out dollars, largely using philanthropy, to pay for navigators. And some of that comes from ACS. We do pay for navigators across the country in as many of the high deserving places as we possibly can. Though we were elated January 1 when this became part of a, a new rule from CMS so that we can now bill for patient navigators and the American Cancer Society was ready. We work again with partnership. We have run for many years the National Navigation Roundtable, so we knew what best practices looked like, and they, these navigators need to be certified. So January 1, we were ready and lifted up our patient navigation certification program called LION, and, uh, and we are right now actively training patient navigators and, and putting them into the world so that individuals can complete their care as planned, lower cost of care, and everybody wins. So huge shout out to the, you know, everybody who worked with us on that partnership, but also the Biden administration for hearing the call. It was one of those tangible things we could do right now that we, we also know, based on evidence, is a major lever to reduce cancer care inequities. So you teed up something that I want to touch on quickly, and I know some of you may be more eager to answer this than others, but we did have this thing called the State of the Union the other night. One of the major areas, I loved how much health care there was, was on cancer. And President Biden talked about the fact that cancer is the second leading cause of death, only behind heart disease. One of the things that he talked about that I was a little surprised because it didn't feel aggressive enough, and this is where I think we need to move from like moonshot to lots of ground shots. And that is he said, in 25 years, we'd like to cut the rate of death due to cancer by 50%. That feels like that's a long way out to 50% is good, but like, why can't we have all cancers, you know, cured or not killing people by then. Any thoughts or reactions to that, Harlan? Well, well a few thoughts on that. First of all, I want to re-emphasize, you won't even achieve those numbers if you don't get to the whole population. So it, the, the treatments, were, we, we, this is an era of amazing, groundbreaking cures and discoveries, but if you don't get to the whole population, you can't hit those numbers. So that, that's uh, number one. Number two, as I listen to it, I'm a you know big supporter of of the ACA. I love his focus on healthcare, but I always get worried that people confuse coverage, like insurance coverage, with access. And I want to make sure we don't like we don't. Can, can you split hairs on that? Because I don't think everyone understands what the difference between coverage and access is, because it's a really really important point to this conversation. Well, so we gave a few examples of you can have Medicaid coverage. But that doesn't mean you have all the um, coverage for the specific th things you need for the appropriate diagnosis. In fact, there's data from, I think, as you see, Davis, that showed that there were, if you had Medicaid or Medi-Cal in California, you actually had a worse outcome from cancer for several cancer types that compared to insured groups. But the startling data was you actually had a worse outcome than from people who didn't have any insurance at all. Like you were better off in the county system than you were with Medicaid. So that's an example. And then my big issue is, as you heard, the narrow networks. It's really subtle, but if you don't have access to the expertise that you need, you're not going to get the same outcome. And I just want to just build on the supportive care element. City of Hope has invested heavily in supportive care. We get grants on it. We have large number of of, of um, navigators, to use the term, um, but 
for decades, even when it, all the data was clear that people got better, the insurance companies would say, well, we, we don't want to pay for that. We'll do our navigators, not cancer expert, not coordinated with the physician team. Everyone wants to be divided. So finally, we have a breakthrough where the providers that are providing the care can actually oversee the navigation. So my point is you have coverage, you might even have a, a benefit, but it's not truly integrated with the care team and it's not sensitive to the need of the cancer patient. We need to start building solutions around the family unit and the cancer patient, not thinking about it from a health plan point of view. So one important area that I do want to touch on, and I actually found out a fun fact, I was this many years old when I learned about sometimes how um, institutional discrimination comes into play with cancer care, our little sidebar conversation over here. But one of the most important organizations for companies and organizations to partner with is the federal government. And sometimes they're good at it, and Kareem, cover your ears. Sometimes they're not as good at it. Um, let's talk a little bit about sort of what could change or how could we improve, and then I know, Karen, you agreed to talk a little bit about this menthol cigarette issue, which I was not aware of. So, Cliff, do you want to start? Well, let me just say there's never been a government on earth that invested in STEM in general, health, medicine, and cancer research like the United States government. So we have plenty to be proud of on a proportionate basis and on a raw dollar basis. No enterprise like the NIH and NCI exists anywhere else. That said, um, I do think that there are opportunities for greater um, nimbleness and flexibility, and I think there are great opportunities for partnership, and I, in fact, I think the recently stood up ARPA-H opportunity may indeed uh, highlight some of that or, or provide Can you that. Because that was mentioned in the State of the Union as well, and I don't know as though everyone understands what ARPA-H is. Can you just maybe spend 30 At seconds? At a high on level, it's modeled off of DARPA, which brought you the internet. And the idea here is that you set specific goals for deliverables. You could think of it as contracts. And the projects are evaluated along the way against expected milestones. And they fund and defund the projects based upon their progress. And, and so it's a very different model from the traditional grant making that has held sway at the NIH and NCI. And I don't want to be seen as criticizing. What I'm saying is there's room for both models. But in this case, a great example of a DARPA project would be, I want a battery that's the size of a suitcase that will power um, a lunar module for 180 days on a trip. I don't know how to get there, but I know that's the deliverable. In healthcare, I want an implantable portable kidney device. And I don't know how I'm going to get there, but I'm going to contract to make that happen. I think the challenge for us in ARPA-H in oncology will be being very clear and confident about which goals might be attainable. Because coming back to the wide number of cancers we're treating and their unique underlying biology, there's an inherent challenge. But I'm optimistic that ARPA-H will add resources and deliverables. So I appreciate, and that's good to know that we are the uh, leading country in terms of the research and STEM and all that. It's not all good all the time, and Karen, you promised that you would talk a little bit about something I think a lot of people don't know about. Yeah, I mean, again, we're really focused, I uh, agree with everything that, that Cliff and Harlan said, but very focused on ground shots of things, the tangible things that you can do right now. So State of the Union, was it aggressive enough? Probably not in terms of the overall milestone goal. But I think you probably want to under-promise and over-deliver, right? That's, that's the way we see it. So, so let's go. What can you do? One, we must shift to early detection and prevention. Straw poll, how many people here, raise your hand if you feel that you're 100% compliant with your cancer screening? Oh, lots okay, of that's them. like three. three people. Okay, three, five. so you exemplify the issue, and it's not your fault. We've made it really hard for you to understand. I'm trying to demystify. Two, those pre cancer prevention and screening strategies have to go to home. That's where we're seeing cancer research now reach people in rural communities and getting to home. Three, what can you do right now that would eliminate hundreds of thousands of people in the next 10 years dying from cancer? Complete the proposed ban on menthol cigarettes and flavored tobacco. This has been an FDA studied problem for years, and this is something that for which there is no scientific evidence um, that to, to stop this, this uh, movement. It's been proposed. What needs to happen is the White House needs to uh, propose a finalization of the rule. 
menthol cigarettes and flavored tobacco disproportionately impact black communities and youth. They are targeted to black communities and youth. And this is something that has been completed already in Massachusetts and in California. So we know that this, this FDA, this ban actually, which is against distributors and manufacturers, not individuals, no one's gonna go to jail for smoking a menthol cigarette. But there is no reason not to do this. It's within the grasp of this administration right now. We thought they were going to do it. And this is what we are urgently um, asking the Biden administration to complete in 2024. So we're coming toward the end of our prepared session, and then we do want to get to q and I want to close with two, one, of, one serious and one fun question. I know this is not a fun topic, but I like people to get to know the people that are driving the change. So the not fun question, or the, the more serious is, what's one takeaway? And I think we've probably already covered it. 30 seconds, and then we'll go to the fun island question of albums. Cliff, why don't we start with you? My takeaway is collaboration makes a difference. Almost everything that we spoke about here has represented the impact of collaboration. And along with that, it takes a little bit of patience. I admire Karen's urgency. We need that to drive us, but we also have to stick to the task. So most of the things that we're trying to do take a bit of time and steady pressure. And not one of the advances we spoke about happened because of a single group. And I probably add focus to that, right? So I think sometimes, and this is where you get too scattered, but focus on the problem, chip away, and be patient and know that it might take 10, 20 years to get there. And, and I'll just add, having succeeded with the Clinical Treatment Act, which was not us alone, although we were really dedicated to it, we now have to pivot to enforcement at the 50 state level. Harlan, what's your key takeaway? My, my key takeaway would be that we need to understand that cancer is different from other conditions. It only inf impacts you know, a new diagnosis one half percent a year, maybe one to two percent are active. The solutions we need for that are different from what we need for you know, diabetes and other conditions. And we're able to really bring the focus. So my takeaway would be let's learn from what works and let's build on it. So we know HPV vaccine works. Let's learn from the pandemic about the value of communication. Let's communicate that vaccine correctly. You know, we talk about it being antiviral. People think of it as anti-STD. It's anti-cancer. Let's get the word out appropriately. So, you know, learn. Medicare Advantage, I know you wanted 30 seconds, but I, I you know, it works for primary care. It's better for prevention. My thesis is it's, just, it's not working as well as it should for cancer patients. So let's pivot. Let's modernize the definition of network adequacy and make sure that Medicare Advantage programs all have the full continuum of services available for cancer patients for everyone that's enrolled. That would be a quick solution that could be mandated and enacted tomorrow. Can we get an amen? Dr. Yeah. K, bring us home. Mine's simple. Coming from healthcare, I know there's, there are two things that are true. One, I will never fix healthcare. It's going to be an ongoing iterative process and I'm not even going to try. But what I can do, this is two, is I can empower people to have the information that they need to prevent and survive cancer. So my takeaway is if I could wave a magic wand, I would like everyone the next time that they're in the physician's office, I don't care what they're in for, to ask one simple, powerful question. What is the right cancer screening plan for me? Because you can't wait to be asked. It invites the commentary about your family history, your genetics, if you know it, your own health history. And if every person in the country did that, I think we'd have different outcomes from cancer. Well, thank you for very prescriptive recommendations. And we ask everyone here and in the virtual world to carry these forward. Now we will end on something a little fun, and I do this on my regular podcast. And again, this is to help to get to know you as the individuals. And I'm going to pick on you again, Karen. So imagine you're on a uh, deserted island. You can bring one album with you, not a greatest hits ideally. Which album would you pick and why? Yeah, this is really easy for me. I love music. My husband and I talk about this all the time. I would pick uh, American Beauty from The Grateful Dead. Just makes me happy. Makes Jim Weiss happy. Cliff, when I asked the question, you immediately knew what your answer was. I'm yeah, because the single greatest rock and roll album ever made is Exile on Main Street by the uh, Rolling Stones, recorded in a drug-addled state in the basement of a house in France, importing the Delta blues and making the most of all these genres into this 
secret magical outcome. It's playable end to end, 30 years later, nothing changed. I love that it wasn't just this is my favorite, it's everyone's favorite, and there's no debate about that. And I would tend to agree with you. And that is one of the criteria, I think, is like, do you love every song on there? And ideally, it brings back memories, right, Harlan? Is it really only 30 years old? It might be more. Yeah, pray. Um, so for me, it's Yellow Brick Road. And, also a good one. And the reason for that is I love the Beatles and the Stones, but I was just at that age that they, weren't, they were not my group. They were the slightly older group, so I didn't feel like I owned it. But Yellow Brick Road, and every decade I listen to it, I actually like it more. Did he just call you old, Cliff? He I just did. Think he did. Yeah. Know For being honest, When he did. I was a little boy, I went to Corvettes at Welsh and Boulevard and bought the original um, Sticky Fingers album with the working zipper. Wow. Yeah, I wasn't allowed to get on the bus alone back then, so... <laughs> I will say, especially for those that are of the younger generation, the beauty is it's nice to have music so accessible. You do miss that tactile experience with the album covers and the liner notes and all those things. You can so do it again. It's bring them back. Bring them back. All right. So we have 10 minutes. I have two asks. If you want to ask a question, uh, we have mic runners. So please wait until someone comes because we want everyone to be able to hear. Please keep your question short. And I'd like maybe one or two people to answer it so we can get to more questions. Uh, and then we'll wrap up in 10 minutes. So I just, you mentioned the outcome it seems everyone's obsessed about is death. You know, cancer competes with cardiometabolic, maybe number one killer that was in the speech. Like now that people are getting cancer four or five times, they're surviving at rates. Why isn't our outcome more morbidity, not mortality? Yeah, I th you're referring to cancer survivorship. And in fact, this is such an important component of ending cancer as we know it for everyone is not just survival. It's survival with a good quality of life. And thanks to clinical trials, thanks to cancer research innovation, we now have diseases for which we have multiple options for individuals to consider. So having those goals of care conversations about what someone's life will be like post-cancer therapy is part of the new standard. I couldn't agree more. And of course, that is both a harder thing to measure and uh, in a way a more deliverable one because even for the many, many cancers that we sadly can't cure, survival is much longer. In my own career, the anecdotes are overwhelming. I started off HER2 positive breast cancer. A, we didn't even recognize it. We just knew this was, it was a, ba a bad breast cancer that was as lethal acutely as leukemia, it seemed. And now, of course, that's the best subtype of breast cancer because of breakthroughs. We still don't cure everybody, but people live a long time, and how they live is critically important, to your point. And if I can just also having survivors networks, where it's one of the things that we do to match individuals to someone who's been through that treatment journey so that they can help make um, informed choices about what treatment option they might want that's associated with what quality of life. So it's beyond just talking to the provider, but also talking to someone who's truly lived the, in, that, in that journey uh, is a really important component of peer-to-peer um, -peer networks. So thank you for the question. We have one over here, and I, we see your hand up here. There's one back there, and so go ahead. Thank you so much for this session. Fly, Eagles, fly, first of all. Second of all, if you've been on a desert island, you don't want an album. You want water and a sat phone. As someone well, that, who's that, been that's there. a given, so I didn't mention <laughs> that part, but thank you for calling that up. And then I was wondering if you could speak to one of the issues with vaccinations, that whether it's very specific for infectious disease and cancer is a benefit, the attitude of anti-vaccine and how do we overcome that? Could making it more about cancer be a way that we change that? How do we move it forward? So actually, Harlan, I, I'll give you the opportunity because you didn't answer the last one. If you want to pass, then we'll pass it to one of your esteemed colleagues. I'll pass on this one. I'd love to, I'll, I may chime in on this survivorship later if there's time, but. So we do deploy individuals. It's part of my ACS CAN strategy, the advocacy teams across, and my patient support teams in all, all 50 states and Puerto Rico. That's actually how Puerto Rico got to the 90% vaccination rate. But, you know, educating people that to Harlan's point that this is a cancer vaccine um, is really key because when it was initially rolled out by the CDC, it was rolled out as an STD vaccine. So all these years later, we're still suffering from bad marketing. And so getting people over that is really important, but there's a possibility right here in the state of Texas, during COVID, we were able to increase HPV vaccination uptake at the same time that COVID vaccination was highly, you know, controversial. Actually, Harlan, can we let Harlan go and then Cliff, I'll let you get the next one. 
You know, I think it's parsing through the data that really helps you understand what needs to get done. So, like taking HPV, for example, during COVID, you were right, across the country, there were certain segments that actually were able to maintain their rates of vaccine, vaccination, but there were subpopulations, particularly the, uh, people from underrepresented communities that had been doing so well in this area that started to drop off. and. And, and, and to Karen's point, this is not an overall fix, but City of Hope, actually, at least in our markets, in our communities that we serve, we invested with um, support of the federal government, donors, um, and um, a, a, a national, a federal grant. We um, developed a prevention and screening mobile van that allow us to go directly into the community. And the reason why that's relevant is what we want to do is not just show up and do vaccination day. We want to change the culture of that community and make getting vaccines, getting prevention, personalizing the approach relevant to that community. So even when the van's not there in two weeks, people are still talking about the importance of vaccination. I think that's how you're going to have to do this is going to be through messaging in one community at a time. I love it. Marketing, messaging, those are two of the keys, right? We have a question back here. Yeah, Harlan, you kind of touched on this, but can you say a bit more about what, how you think about integrating with behavioral health um, specialists, helping cancer patients on that journey, um, collaborating with other you know, mental health providers to ensure that cancer patients are getting that side of care as well? Yeah, I, I suspect all three of us will have something to say in this matter. But as Karen said, the outcomes are clearly better if you nav have navigation and if you have behavioral health support. Um, the, you know, un unlike other chronic illnesses, there's something about cancer that impacts the entire family, and it it is disruptive to nor, you know, your normalcy of life, and people are prone to get depressed, they're prone to get anxious. I can tell you the uncertainty of cancer, waiting for that next result to come, knowing that you have a five-year arc or a 10-year, it, it makes it very difficult to, you can survive the cancer, but you may not survive the, the, the journey. So having behavioral support by people who really understand the cancer experience, I would say, is vital. You know, in the same way that Karen said, go in, to, you know, and ask what the prevent, what your preventive strategy should be. Every cancer patient should be going in and asking their doctor for support. Every doctor, by the way, should be screening, looking for mental health or behavioral health issues. It's more than just depression and anxiety. It's really just coping mechanism. It's sleep. It's you know, attention to good behaviors. And and if you don't have that integrated supportive care, you're really missing a key element of, of, of cancer treatment. Anything to add, Cliff? The, the only thing I'd add is we need to take another step towards integrating this and aligning incentives. So for example, the way we assess the quality of care should include access to these kinds of resources. That's a way to answer the question. And I do want to emphasize, though, more on the emotional side, this distinction that you've rightly pointed out several times about heart disease and diabetes vis-a-vis -vis cancer. I'm very, very sensitive to the burden that we sometimes place on patients through, in particular, the belief that lifestyle or diet might have an acute impact on their cancer. The truth is there's virtually no evidence for that in any setting, and demanding that people somehow take on that burden makes them feel maybe doubly victimized in some cases. So a healthy diet and lifestyle changes are critically important on lots of fronts, but we should at the same time support patients that their outcome, good, bad, or otherwise, isn't really their fault. It's about us and our delivery of high quality care. 15 second build. Behavioral health needs to be reimbursed as part of cancer care. Right now it is not. Great ad. Question up front. Thank you for all of this. Um, how can audiologists partner with oncologists on a um, more systemic way so that we can provide hearing health care for people who suffer ototoxic hearing loss due to carboplatin and cisplatin because survivorship is um, becoming increasing? Hearing loss goes with that, and hearing loss is also associated with social isolation and loneliness and um, even cognitive decline at this point. A short answer, we hope to be reducing the use of those platinum salts 
with every advance in precision oncology and lowering the toxicity, it's a remarkable story. But right now, 20% of people ultimately in their cancer journey get a platinating agent. And so right now, it's a reality. I think we have a long way to go as well to train primary care for when someone is completed, their, you know, becomes a five-year-plus cancer survivor, and they're back in the hands of primary care as their, as their major um, you know, providing physician, that they're trained to understand what does it look like? How do I take care of a cancer survivor and a cancer survivor who has suffering from the ancillary effects of cancer treatment. We have a long way to go in healthcare to, to fix that. Final thought, because this is our final question. So 30 seconds. Well, so it's just on Karen's point. It, it's interesting because, you know, again, the managed care world says survivorship is just which preventive screenings do you need to do? But there's this whole slew of new complications from the new drugs that are happening. And there's a gap today. People don't want to have to go to the oncologist to get the care five, eight years down the road, but primary care, and I'm a primary care doc, we're not prepared to take care of those illnesses. So there's a huge gap that needs to get filled. And again, mental health, navigation, survivorship, these are, these are the, the underspoken about issues of cancer care that we need to bring more visibility to. Awesome, well that concludes our session. So I want to do two things, one, Give yourselves a big round of applause for showing up early on a Sunday and hearing probably one of the best panels that you'll hear while you're at South by. Humble brag. And then if we could give a loud round of applause for these amazing guests. Thank you, Cliff, Karen, Harlan, for sharing such amazing inspiration and advice. Thank you. <laughs>